And yes, that gets exactly. us to what I think was one of the most fat. I don't. I know people have been disagreeing with me about this <laughs> since it came out. But I think one of the most fascinating papers at San Antonio this year for the presentation was by Nielsen. Oh, oh, oh you're wrong. <laughs> so who wants to take on that one, Chrissy? Well, you want to well, you I mean, describe the Nielsen paper? Because so, that gets the hope's question exactly. So the Nielsen paper was looking at whether the um, luminal A and luminal B whether they're actually predictive of um, benefit from chemotherapy. Uh, because certainly a lot of people in the community say, well, I have a luminal A patient, so they obviously won't benefit from chemotherapy. It's like, where's that data? So now we, we have, have a little bit of data. A little bit. Okay, fine. So this is a, a, they, a little bit of data. But no when endocrine they, therapy, though. When they did their presentation, Great. they, you know, recognized that there are very few uh, studies out there that have leftover blocks for which there's long-term information about the patients and they went back to a really old trial where patients either got CMF, cytoxan, uh, placebo or no therapy at all. And yeah. Lef yeah, yeah, lefamisol. Yeah. <laughs> so like, what? That, so <laughs> I'm old enough to remember very, that very drug. Old. We right. all are. Yes, very right. old. You might, Sarah may be the only one here <laughs> who's not, you know. <laughs> so they separated the groups. Drug. They showed that the patients who got CMF and cytoxan essentially did the same long term from the study and that the other groups didn't do so well. Now, one of my, so what it showed is that the luminal A's did not seem to benefit from chemotherapy and that the luminal B's or everything else, including basal subtype and HER2, did um, seem to get uh, some benefit from chemotherapy. Endocrine therapy was not used as a standard of care. Because it wasn't back then. Right. Mm -hmm. Back then, no one used right, endocrine right. therapy. It wasn't standard mm -hmm. of care 25 years ago. But do you ago. know whether patients benefit from chemotherapy if they have endocrine therapy on board, number one? Number two, there's a fair number of premenopausal women in this group, all of whom are having their ovaries shut down by the chemotherapy. So where maybe this is an endocrine benefit that these patients are receiving. But that's what was worrisome to me. There wasn't the benefit, there though. There was a 25-year follow-up, and there was no benefit. That, in, the that, in the luminal A's. In the right. luminal A's. And there should have been an endocrine benefit. Right. That's right. what made it me didn't just make any sense. not believe any of the data right. at all, because where was the endocrine benefit from in this luminal A and this premenopausal high-risk group? Five centimeters or greater, and no positive. They were very high risk. They should have had an endocrine they benefit. They should have had an endocrine benefit. So the benefit, data just was not making internal uh, consistency sense to me, so I'm like, and I think I that's know. the problem with some mm -hmm. of those retrospective mm -hmm. data sets is that you can be sort of waylaid. And so if you see something that's inconsistent, you have to be really cautious in interpreting it. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. But I mean I, I mean, I would agree with you. But on the other hand, the, the N, the number of patients that was involved in this trial were the same that we used for the high risk in Oncotype DX and in, um, in the SWOG study. 88-14. Um, the 88-14 that we also used for node positives with Oncotype DX. And not and so, all women have their ovaries shut off by chemo. That's another point. Well, that's another thing. point. We We're assuming that they all patients. were, and it's CMF, it's and you know how old they are. And Oral and makes, CMF in young women was pretty. Yeah, but you see a lot of patients who continue <coughs> to have ovarian functions, even though they're amenorrheic after chemotherapy. Now that we're using. Uh, well, with now chemo, it's very and, different, yeah, but yeah, I think well, with oral CMF, if you gave oral CMF to anybody who was 35 or over, you toasted their ovaries. I but mean. Joyce that <laughs> raises another one. We should probably move on because we've got metastatic disease to talk yeah, about here, But because yeah. we can go on for this forever. But the, the real question, Joyce, though, is maybe there's a section of, maybe there are some patients who don't need anything. Well, I agree that's with that. That's the point. That's, and maybe that, that maybe yeah. that's what this says, that there's someone who yeah. doesn't need anything. That's what the um, uh, Taylor Rex uh, 10 and under has said to me was like, well, maybe these are some cancers that really don't have metastatic potential. It'll be interesting to see the follow-up from year 6 through 10, you know, off endocrine therapy, presumably for most of them, to see. Because so far, the, the retrospective low recurrence score group, when you get out to the 6 to 10, gee, the data look terrific. You know, suggesting that that's a really, you know, in that, that strongly ER positive, low proliferative group. If that stays up in the top. They just stay There's right just up like there. There's just like one or two relapses. And I right stopped now. today in the clinic. When I have one of those gals, you know, whether I've had a recurrent score, whether they're ERP are really positive, really low proliferative, they get to, and no negative, they get to the end of that five years, I stop. Me too. And so the question though is, but it, it, there could be people that anatomically, there could be women that anatomically look terrible, mm -hmm. right? Right. You know, five centimeter tumor, mm -hmm. 15 nodes positive, 
and they maybe still relapse. And they relapse whether they get into therapy right. or not. Right. It doesn't right. have prognosis, but they don't benefit. No, no. They, benefit don't from, they don't benefit from interventions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. No, I right. don't know that. I think that um, those patients benefit from, uh, in general, from endocrine therapy. I'm sure we can identify a group that are resistant and aren't going to benefit. I think the question is that you may have a, a high risk of relapse. But chemotherapy may not alter that, right? And that's right. the biggest issue. And Prognosis it's, it's versus, you know, kind of a tough situation from our standpoint because we look at these young women and we think, you know, I know you have a high relapse rate, but you have a low score and it's a low risk disease. But I'm still going to give you chemo, mm -hmm. and we all do and because we, treat, we don't because know. Because we're treating that. ourselves. <laughs> we so not, are we treating well, the patient right. or treating but ourselves? We're waiting for the data. We're waiting for the data. <laughs> right. Right. We're waiting for the data. Okay, I agree. With that.